The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> My name is Caitlin Thompson. I'm the producer of the San Diego uh, AWARE Project. Um, the AWARE Project was founded in LA by Ashley Booth. And then her and I decided to bring it to San Diego so that we can spread the awesomeness. How many of you have been to an AWARE Project event before? All right, how many of you, is this your first time? Wow, a lot, a lot of new faces. Great, well, um, just to tell you a little bit about the AWARE Project, um, our goal is to provide a safe community space where people can come together and create balanced dialogue around psychedelics so that we can spread accurate information and create community and connections and help lift the stigma about these compounds so that we can investigate them thoroughly and accurately evaluate their risks and benefits in society as tools for various things. So um, one thing to note, uh, please, 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 um, when you come to these events, please don't come here to buy, sell, um, or even talk about illegal activity because we really want to create a safe space and we never know if you know someone is gonna be coming who's an undercover or something and we just really want to like maintain the, um, the sanctity of this place as a place that we can freely speak without being in fear of any sort of um, legal repercussions so please um, honor that and make sure that you're not uh, breaking any laws when you come to an AWARE project event, and we really appreciate that. Um, so, our presenter today is Eric Schoberg, and he's a friend of mine, and he is a somatic educator, and he does a lot of work with somatic trauma therapy and um, often helps people with psychedelic integration so that they can take their psychedelic experiences and um, properly um, sort of, well, I guess, integrate them into their lives so that they can actually be applied in positive ways. He leads a lot of um, various groups and organizations uh, surrounding somatic education, and he is bringing his somatic skills to the MDMA uh, psychotherapists that are going to be performing in the uh, new phase three trials for MDMA um, and assisted psychotherapy for PTSD um, that MAPS is funding. So we're really excited. They just got FDA approval to move forward with their phase three clinical trials last week. And so Eric has been helping the psychologists that are ready to assist many people struggling with PTSD and um, bring a somatic essence to their therapeutic practices. So thank you, Eric, and please welcome Eric Schober. Thank you, Caitlin. <sighs> All right, well, let me start this gizmo. Um, we have, we have the best technology here in this room ever. Yeah, all right.
so this is this is the first time I've spoken publicly about this work, um, and it's the first time I've spoken publicly about my own my own experience as a client with a psychedelic psychotherapist. Um, and so this, in essence, for me, is uh, a coming out party. Um, <laughs> yes, many of you have known me for a while and have known this part of me, but um, I've been reticent to speak publicly about it, uh, in particular because the people that have helped me are at risk doing what they did. And, um, and that's the tides on that are changing now, and I'm glad for that. They're not done. They have a long ways to go still, but we're, we're making progress. <clears throat> so, yeah, let's get started. How many of you have used psychedelics recreationally with friends or at a festival? Almost the whole room. Um, how many of you have used them in plant medicine ceremonies with a shaman in ceremony? Hmm? How many of you have used them with headphones and an eye mask and a sitter? A few. Beautiful. How many of you have used them in a therapeutic setting with an experienced therapist? Yeah. How many of you have heard of soul retrieval? Wow. Awesome. A lot of people. <clears throat> How many of you have gaps in your childhood memory? How far back do you remember? What do you do with those gaps? What do you make of that? For me, I have huge gaps in all of my childhood. I have bits and pieces, but for the most part, my childhood is not accessible. And you'll hear more about why. <clears throat> so this is going to be a little journey today. It's my intention. I'll take you on a little journey with the help of a Prezi slide presentation that I've been playing with. Um, and I want to do a flyover of a lot of material, a lot of different things, little different aspects of what is underneath what I see is necessary for doing soul retrieval work, for helping people become healed from places where they fragmented. <clears throat> and I think we need to do a little prep before we go into this, because this is kind of deep work. So if you're willing, I'd like you to stand up. <clears throat> <clears throat> and start by inhaling and raising your arms up, filling your lungs, and then exhaling and folding over at the waist if you feel like it, or just bringing your arms down, and standing up again. And take three deep breaths like this, and get your body open and relaxed, and get your dinner moving if you were just having pasta. <clears throat> And when you're done, stand with your eyes closed. <clears throat> and I'm going to say some words, one at a time. And I invite you to change your body in such a way as to feel the essence of each word and to communicate it. So the first word is presence being present. Find a posture or a sensation of being present. Power. Love. Feel the expression and sensation of love. Now I want you to find a partner, 
pair up, if you're willing. Eyes open. Eyes open. Much easier to find a partner with your eyes open. So now pick partner A and partner B. Partner A, be in the posture of presence. Partner B, be in the part posture of presence. Feel what that's like. Partner A, stay in presence. Partner B, power. Partner B, stay in power. Partner A, love. Now, randomly, when I ring the bell, switch to a different word. Really get it dramatic with this if you can. Magnify it, take the risk. There, we got some theatrics in the room, good. All right, so talk for 30 seconds a piece about this experience. <clears throat> Switch if you haven't. it up and find your seats again. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me in the back? In the, all right. A little louder. All right. Let me see if I can make that happen. All right. How's that? Is that better? Yes. All right. Good. <clears throat> Today, I will talk a little bit about my own journey in this work. Trauma, soul fragmenting, a little about consciousness, the unconscious, how to relate to those gaps in your memory that I spoke of earlier. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about those three words that we just played with power, love, and presence. And I'm also going to talk about how they relate to trauma and to soul retrieval in the way that I'm playing with it. <clears throat> I'll also talk about different modalities of using psychedelics and the ways that they're similar and different and really inviting you to explore your perspectives of what this is. There are practitioners and therapists in the audience that um, are more educated in some of these pieces than I am, and shamans in the audience, and I want to really acknowledge your wisdom and your experience in this and, and invite you to explore what portals open in this. <clears throat> 
What I present is only my perspective as a trauma and somatic therapist, body worker, spiritual counselor, psychonaut, and most importantly, as a trauma survivor myself. <clears throat> my intention is that you walk away from this talk with a better understanding of the different modalities and a different, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and, and looking at different experiences through different lenses and kind of open and explore different, different forms of using psychedelics and integrating them in a way that might help your journey on the planet be more interesting and more healing and more fun. <clears throat> My also, also, my intention to have you look at the unconscious a little more clearly and see how to play with that. This is a slide of an iceberg, which is kind of the representation tonight of the conscious and the unconscious. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over a cough here, so I've got a tickle in my throat. So it's also possible that you have no trauma forgotten or otherwise of any impact in your past, that your lack of memory in your childhood has nothing to do with trauma or soul fragmenting. But it's also possible that in exploring that notion that you have some wonderment, some, some curiosity about it, some concern, which is what I had for much of my life. <clears throat> And if you do have a wonderment, what do you do with that? You know, if you, have a, if you have a sense that maybe there's some memory that you don't recall, and you, you know, what do you do with that? Do you, do you dig in? Do you just say, oh, that's good, better left untouched. I don't need to play with that. Um, so it's, it's really a question that you can feel in yourself. <clears throat> so this is why I'm here. This is me when I was three and a half or four. Um, and, and this is before the big trauma that I know of that happened to me happened. So part of what I want to just name as far as the context of where I came from, both of my parents were trauma survivors. I was an only child and my mother suffered from uh, child molest, violence, and um, um, what was the other thing? And, and my father, my father suffered from trauma, neglect, um, violence, and he got his hands, his arms stuck in a ringer washer at four years of age. He was about that age, and he got, I don't know if you know what a ringer washer is, two rollers, and you put your clothes in and that squeezes the water out. And he got his arm stuck in there for eight hours and very clearly traumatized him for the rest of his life. Thank you. <clears throat> so as near as I can tell in this picture, um, I hadn't had any trauma. I had some neglect and some weird stuff with my parents and my mother in particular, but nothing giant. Then in second grade, it happened. I had a neighbor, dirty old man, um, I was seven years old, and he and his crony um, raped and tortured and nearly killed me, probably more than once. Um, and I didn't do so well with that. It was pretty hard. Um, horrible experience for a seven-year-old. And it took me for a ride. And I fragmented that part of my life, my experience, and tidied it up in a nice little cotton ball and put it deep in my unconscious so that I didn't remember it. I probably did that as it was happening even. It was a very brilliant way that my psyche navigated. I don't think everyone has this kind of response, but it's also very common. Um. <clears throat> so
So all the king's horses and all the king's therapists couldn't put Humpty back together again. I, had, I did decades of therapy, bioenergetics, Reikian, um, pathwork, psychodynamic, cognitive. They all helped a little, and it helped me manage my life more. But the, the gist of it was that I was still fumbling. I was still struggling with depression and financial issues and relationship trouble and social anxiety, fear of public speaking, um, and health issues, for sure, that I believe were all related to that. As a psychonaut, I used LSD and mushrooms and um, MDMA and a number of other medicines. and. Got, a, got closer in, I could feel some of what these were in me, but they were, um, it more just kind of tickled that I have something to deal with here that I couldn't quite get at. It was just there. It was, you know, on the other side of something, and I was striving for it, and I wasn't quite sure I wanted to find it sometimes, and other times I did. <clears throat> Since childhood, I've had... Um, I call them dissociative flashbacks or, or um, yeah, dissociated flashbacks where a part of me was anxious or terrified or feeling some pain or discomfort or sensations in my body that were not good and didn't really fit with what was happening in the moment. And, and I didn't know what that meant. You know, some, there was times when I was a little kid, I would have these times of the tunnel vision where, like, if I was looking at you all, you would all shrink down in a lens to something this big, and I was 100 miles back. I used to have that pretty often when I was a kid. And I'm pretty sure the first time I did it was with my pervy neighbor. <clears throat> So those dissociated flashbacks are really a key piece in doing the work of healing around this. Because they, if we can track that that's what's happening in the, real, in the moment, whether it's, whether it's myself or whether it's someone I'm, I'm working with, it's important to recognize when these things are going on. There can be defensive responses that are hidden in conversation. There can be shaking that doesn't make sense. And where that opens a door into the past. And if we're not understanding what's going on, we don't know how to go through that door. <clears throat> then I did a journey with a psychedelic psychotherapist. And everything changed. That first journey felt like 30 or even 150 therapy sessions. The MDMA and LSD that I took, along with my sitter's exquisite presence and care and attention, took me into a state of consciousness where I could sit next to what I was terrified of. And even as I was sitting with what I knew I was terrified of, Something else I was afraid of opened up on the other side of me, and I was sitting with both of them, and I could manage it. It wasn't easy, but I could manage it. And stuff was moving in my body and in my mind and my heart, and I knew I was safe enough to be able to explore this. <clears throat> so I kept going back. I went back a number of times, and each time, all day long, going in, to, going in deep while he paid his exquisite attention to me and brought his divine curiosity into what was happening for me. And I could feel his heart and his care and his presence with me. And I began to unravel this material bit by bit, sometimes a big chunk, but mostly bit by bit. <clears throat> During this time, I was in the somatic experiencing trauma training, which some of you may know of. It's one of the premier models of working with trauma. Um, it's not just a technique. It's a whole kind of 
paradigm of physiology and understanding the body and somatics and how that all works together. And so I was simultaneously processing what was happening in me using the SE work, even as I was getting support from my, sis, my sitter. And I was, I was blown away by my ability to navigate these pendulations of shaking and crying and vomiting and retching in all ways and possibilities in myself. And part of that was through the SE work and the way that SE has this gentle pendulation in and out. And I was really getting that planted in my nervous system in this work. <clears throat> And I, this is where I recognize these dissociated flashbacks as portals into what was going on for me. <clears throat> I want to introduce um, a little more on power, love, and presence. We've played with it a little bit. And I want to thread this through the presentation, as I mentioned. So through both my work on myself and with clients doing somatic experiencing and other kinds of spiritual counseling, um, as well as psychedelic integration work, I began to see that we as beings have kind of three primary light bulbs in us, three primary ways of being human. And I, I think these are the words that I've been playing with and still looking for more. I'm not settled on this being final. So if anybody has more that don't fit underneath those umbrellas, let me know. But I'm, um, I find that if, when we have these energies full in us, we are all that we can be. And we can experience all that we can from other people and from life. <clears throat> and trauma and neglect and all of these pieces diminish our ability to be present, our ability to be powerful, our ability to be love. And so the, the work becomes in part navigating the energetics, the body, the emotion of each of these. <clears throat> For instance, a trauma survivor may perceive in their body, mind, and heart that power is bad. This is one of the most common things that I run into in clients is, is this notion that their own power in particular is bad because someone who had power over them hurt them with that power. And then the recognition that they have not really integrated power, love, and presence and the found connection to their own power became quite clear. Power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power connecting everything that stands against love. Martin Luther King particularly poignant for me right now and where we are on the planet and what's happening in this country. <clears throat> so let's go a little deeper into these, so the essential aspects of self. So without presence, reality is not available. Leaving our bodies via numbness, dissociation, fantasy, substance abuse are all powerful ways to survive and cope with trauma. Coming back into presence is, an es is essential to healing it. Being here now in this body, this moment, this place is all we have. This presence is where reality lives. Otherwise, we're in fantasy or some kind of dissociation, and reality is not available to us if we're not present. It's an essential found, found building block. Feeling and being capable, so for power, feeling and being capable of protection, a 
of ourself and others and providing for ourselves and others. It gives us a unique value and a unique sensation of being human when we can do that. And when we can't, it's, it has its own set of problems. Love. Bonding is perhaps the most powerful force on the planet. It's a, something to ponder. Sue Johnson, who's a attachment theory teacher, created Emotionally Focused Therapy, said that, and it still rings my bell. I think it's accurate. You can look at under politics and even greed and a lot of things out there. There might be some distorted drive towards bonding that is happening underneath a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> so the effects of trauma on the essential aspects of self. So trauma, fight, flight, freeze, <clears throat> trauma knocks, out, knocks us out of ourselves, out of presence, out of power, out of love, sometimes all of them. <clears throat> so fight, flight, or freeze, right? Everybody's heard these three terms. So fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is lack of presence. It's dissociation. It's, um, there's a lot of different permutations of that. Uh, you know, depression, dissociation, all kinds of ways that we can not be present. Deer in the headlights. Just think that notion. Deer in the like, whoa, I can't do it. Um, trauma leads to numbness and dissociation, checking out. Again, without presence, reality is not available. Trauma makes reality not available. <clears throat> Power. Trauma occurs when defenses are overpowered, resulting in power problems, including aggression, persecution, submission, fear, Narcissism, manipulation, victim mentality, just to name a few. Love, trauma usually breaks or distorts bonds to oneself, like self-love, self-care, self-esteem is interrupted when we have trauma. The notion that love is scarce and must be paid for in some way or manipulated or cheated or stolen happens when we have trauma. Abandonment and engulfment anxieties, having someone leave us that we care for or having someone swallow us up that we care for. Low self-esteem, compulsive rescuing, to name a few. <clears throat> trauma is what happens when we are knocked out of ourselves, out of our presence, power, and love. <clears throat> what are the types of trauma that we need to look at? There are many types. Depending on what model you're looking at, I'll present a little on two types. I think they're kind of umbrella types. Developmental shock trauma and shock trauma. Shock trauma happens when suddenly when an experience that overwhelms with an experience that overwhelms us. Developmental trauma happens slowly to children. Both can have effects that last a lifetime, either can be obvious or very hidden, or anywhere in between. Failed attachment in developmental trauma, whether caused by abuse, neglect, or emotional unavailability on the part of the caretaker, can negatively impact brain structure and function, causing developmental or relational trauma. Early life trauma affects future self-esteem, social awareness, ability to learn, and physical health. John Bowlby was the father of uh, attachment theory. Um, and this quote is, we're only as needy as our unmet needs. So what are our needs? We need love. What are the, what is love? We, the, the attachment theorists have now kind of figured out what love is in the last 20 years. Sue Johnson has another quote I love, which is, 
that's more amazing than putting man on the moon. It's a big deal that we, can, we actually have a definition of it. I'm not going to go into the definitions of it. It's too heady. But I have a series of words that I play with that work for it. The first of which is safety. And without safety, none of the rest of the words are accessible. We have to have safety as children in order to be able to receive the rest. Starting with attunement. So feel into each one of these. Imagine one or both of your parents as each one of these words come up on the screen. and Feel whether they did that with you when you were a kid. Not now, when you were growing up. So attunement. Affection. Appreciation. Allowing. Giving you enough freedom too much. Attention. Play. Feel into these. These are important. So next is shock trauma. Shock trauma, which is not the same as the medical condition, of shock is created by our instincts and creates an altered state of consciousness. This is, in effect, survival. Survival mode that we go into. When we feel our life is threatened, our ability to respond is overwhelmed. <coughs> Symptoms are energetic phenomenon that serve the person by providing a way to manage and bind the tremendous energy of the original threat and the subsequent response to it. So you can see the place where I did that with the experience that I had. I bound it up and dissociated it and put it away. That was shock. <clears throat> family systems are a big piece of it. How many of you came from a family that looked like this? Who was happy and yummy like that? All right, a little few, it's good. How many were more like this? A little more drama more pain. So feeling into that and recognizing that there may have been some impacts on your psyche, on how you've shown up as a person since then. So John Bradshaw was uh, a leader in the recovery movement 20 years ago or so. And he spoke of family systems as a mobile so that if you look at this closely, you can see that it's a, it's a mobile, like it hangs over a kid's bed. And when something happens to one person, it affects the whole system, which I think is really important. But not quite ugly enough to describe the family system that I came from or the families that I, of people that I work with. This is a little more accurate. This is a rat tangle. These are rats that lived like this. They, um, they had to find food, water, poop, pee, deal with death, and deal with scarcity, tons of scarcity, difficulty, manipulation, domination, submission, game playing. This is more accurate family system than a mobile, like I get that more accurately in my bones. <clears throat> All right, so how's everybody doing? This is intense. That last slide in particular was kind of a gnarly one. Do you want a little movement break here or do you want to keep going? Keep going. All right, I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> All right, so what is consciousness? 
We have more conscious, less conscious. We have the presence, power, and love that I've been speaking of in the more conscious and how that shows up. We have dissociation, fragmenting, numbness, repression of memories, emotions, soul loss. We have beauty, love, community, play, creativity. We have lots of things that are in our consciousness, pain, fear, anger, relationship struggles, conflict. So in my journey, in my life, I have been a seeker since about 16 started with Carlos Castaneda and moved on to Gurdjieff and Pathwork and a number of different things. And I was seeking teacher. I was seeking to wake up. I was seeking some form of enlightenment. I was up on the mountain peaks, literally and figuratively, trying to figure this out. And part of that, I would have these moments of wondering, am I trying to be enlightened or am I just trying to get up to normal? And I would go back and forth between these many times and still do it sometimes. And then I recognized that I had left a part of myself behind in my seeking the mountaintop. That this fragmented part of me was there behind me down at the bottom of the mountain and I'd abandoned it and he'd been acting out and having a tantrum and affecting my nervous system every chance he could because I wasn't paying attention to him, just like my parents did. And it was painful for him. So I realized that I needed to bring him with me. And he's with me now. He's underneath the podium because this is scary shit, talking to all you. But I bring him with me. And, and getting to the mountaintop isn't so important to me anymore. It's about being with him and being with all of me. And, and it really has changed this, this high brow, highfalutin notion of enlightenment. I don't, I don't even know what that is anymore. It's about integrating these different parts of myself that, that are what is fascinating to me. So how do we heal our traumas and our troubles? Move more deeply into our unconscious. Self-help books, therapy, support groups, religion, Oprah. And then we have what we're here today to talk about is the psychedelic therapy modalities. And first, before we go into that, I want to talk a little bit about spiritual bypass. How many of you don't know what spiritual bypass is? Oh, all right. I'm, um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, I've been, I'm less so now, but I've been a bit of a spiritual bypass Nazi, like really touting and wanting to proselytize about spiritual bypass. And, and it is important in this kind of work in particular. So spiritual bypass is the use of spiritual practices or beliefs to avoid dealing with painful feelings unresolved wounds, and developmental needs. And it's so pervasive that it goes largely unnoticed. It's a quote from Robert Augustus Masters, who wrote a fantastic book called Spiritual Bypassing. And until I read that book, I'd been teaching about spiritual bypass. And then when I read the book, I realized that I had been teaching about spiritual bypassing while doing it, and wept throughout that book recognizing how, how silly and arrogant I'd been. And I continue to try and check myself and find where that is. But there's other kinds of bypassing. You really can use almost anything for, spirit, for bypassing. You have addictions, work, sex, love, drama, intensity. Intensity is a big one for me. It's part of what has me up here doing this. This is my intensity addiction. And if I'm in the mode of intensity, I'm successfully avoiding being, which is really where that experience of connection with my little one happens, with any one of you. If I'm in my intensity, I'm blocked from it. So that's an ongoing piece of work for me, is navigating the intensity. The other one that I struggled with is cognitive bypass. I'm a thinker. You probably hadn't noticed, but I'm a thinker. 
This is part of what I do. So the other thing I want to talk about before we go into the modalities is set and setting. So we have the preparation of the individual as set. <clears throat> the personality. You know, the person that is doing the medicine, whether it's you or someone that you're with. What's happening in their personality? What's their tendency? Are they obsessive? Are they like really mushy and, and, and um, tactile? Are they often angry? Are they really scattered? What, what, is the, what is that? Take it in. What's the current mood that you're walking into this journey with? Are you depressed? Are you sad? Are you ecstatic? You got a new partner or broke up with an old one? What's your intention? What do you come to this with? The setting is more of the physical environment. The weather, more important if you're outside or nearly outside. What's the room's atmosphere that you're in? Is it quiet? Is there freeway noise? I did an ayahuasca journey years ago downtown in a loft, and there was a TV blaring on, on the other side of the wall the whole night, and outside were sirens going all night. It was kind of intense. Like It became part of the journey, but it was... I would not go to that space again. <laughs> Nor would any of the other people there, I don't think. Social, what are your feelings towards other people in the room? Do you hate them? Do you love them? Do you want to have sex with them? Do you not even notice them? What's, what's the social arena that you're playing in when you walk into that journey? Cultural. What are the prevailing views of the culture that you're in, of the shaman, if it's a shaman or a sitter, your cultural views, the other people in the room? There are people that might be Orthodox of Christian or Orthodox Jew, and they're very rigid in their rules, and doing a journey is a huge step for them. Or they may be, you know, or you, you may be in the Amazon, with someone completely different culture from you, who is your, who's the shaman, who may or may not understand your culture, and you may or may not understand his culture. This is an important, important part of the setting, to understand that and to be in that experience. <clears throat> so the modalities, <clears throat> shamanic, the Groff method, and <clears throat> and the psychotherapeutic. I love this picture of the psychotherapeutic. Can everybody see the, the face of the, of the therapist there? It's Freud. And some woman that reminds me of Triambica playing a guitar. <laughs> <clears throat> so each modality has features, strengths, and challenges. Discover for yourself what they are as best as you can. I'm going to offer some ideas and notions here intended to spark and deepen your curiosity. But these are powerful medicines, extraordinarily powerful medicines. They can, they can bring you to your knees, and they can crumple you like a leaf. <clears throat> so being respectful of the medicine is important, and the different settings that you're playing in here is also important. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, the other piece in here is these medicines can take you and introduce you to God, and they can take you and show you where you are God. And different, different set, different modalities are going to be more or less pr prone to do that for you. So in general, shamanism brings the transpersonal forth, and from there, the personal is affected. The Groff method can facilitate the transpersonal, but I believe it's deeply personal, as there is little or no outside stimulation. The psychotherapeutic brings both of these, as well as, the, as our understandings of trauma, bonding, and the modern science of psychology. For example, Michael and Annie Mithoffer, who are lead investigators in the MDMA trials, uh, PTSD study, 
use a combination of the Groff method and um, the psychotherapeutic. Understanding the physiology of trauma and family systems and attachment, which is what we've been looking at, are all fundamental to soul retrieval. To be transparent, it is my opinion that the psychotherapeutic model is most supportive for soul retrieval, not necessarily for everything that we might want to do. Um, and I'll touch in on that a little bit. So the shamanic, um, just to name a little story, I, my first ayahuasca journey in 1992, I think, I became a rock. I had the consciousness of a rock. And the shaman came and sat with me and was talking to me. And I couldn't understand what he said. I couldn't, I couldn't relate. I was stoned in a way that I'd never been before or since. And I was grateful that the shaman was able to recognize that and come and sit with me. I've not, I've been in, in ceremony where I went into a similar hole like that and I didn't get attention. And I've seen other people go into holes like that and not get attention. And that's not, that's not productive if, in particular, if the person has a lot of trauma. <clears throat> so, let's see, how are we on time, Caitlin? 10 minutes? OK. <clears throat> so in presence with, um, with the shamanic model, um, there is a tremendous access to transpersonal presence, to feeling the presence of spirit or God or the medicine itself, the grandmother ayahuasca the toad or whatever it is, you can sometimes really feel this transpersonal presence that is profound. Um, and shamans have been doing this work for millennia. And between the plants, the study of plants in general, not just psychedelic plants, but plants in general, Western medicine have been following on the tails of shamans. So we have to really respect and honor those practices as being very wise. And it's important to recognize that there are limitations in many ways to each of these modalities. There's no one perfect piece. Um, but we need to get off of our high horses and really listen to these shamanic practices and the shamans. And yeah, and, and we have to recognize as well that the shamans, if in particular indigenous shamans, may not understand us as Westerners in ways that are important, and we may not understand them. There's a lot of reports of kind of miscuing happening, in particular in the, in the jungle work. So access to the mystery, huge. We love that about the shamanic work. The ceremony, the setting, everything really opens that piece up. And there's a lot that can happen in it. However, the group work, where that's usually what's happening, can be problematic if the shaman doesn't have the bandwidth to attend to each person in the room. And it can also be distracting. If there's someone else is going down a different road, and, then, and you're kind of at the edge of some opening, and somebody is know, hurling or screaming, it takes you away from that. They're often dark, which in trauma work becomes a difficulty because we're not able to orient. Orienting response is a physiological track that is essential for coming to presence and stepping out of whatever hole we might be stepping into. <clears throat> Dosages, I've seen dosages be too high in ceremonies quite often or too low. It's difficult for a shaman to be navigating all of that through, through the, the group. 
highly traumatized or dysregulated people tend not to do ceremony in circles. And if they do, they risk traumatization in those circles. <clears throat> I have done a number of integration settings and integration sessions for people that shouldn't have been in those circles that got really, really whacked. So power, access to archetypal forms of terror, helplessness, as well as power. Navigation of these largely at the hands of the plant spirit or the shaman. Lack of agency. Some circles in the medicine work work laying down, and I see that when people are laying down and they're hitting trauma, that's a, that tends to put them into dissociation, whereas if they're sitting up, they have access to their potency. Love, transpersonal love, God experiences. I talked about that already. How many have done toad in here? Yeah. Um, very powerful God experience, love experience possible with that medicine. So the Groff method, I'm going to try and speed it up here so that we can get done. So there's a tendency for dissociation due to the lack of orientation and laying down. Some tolerating of sensation is, um, is blocked. Isolation can be helpful to become more self-focused. So the, having your, your ears in the headphones of the music and your eyes, you can, go, you can drop in really well in that, um, but it has a, it has a difficulty. And I'm, uh, in preparation for this talk, I talked to a number of sitters that, um, that agree with me to a degree. Or, or totally agree with me on that. Um, power, agency is limited due to lack of orientation and feet on the ground. Capacity to move, fight, or flight. I mentioned that already. The, there's a deeply intrapersonal. People really go inside with the headphones and, and sound, um, and they can access some really transpersonal internal healing experiences with love. They can access the inner healer. Psychotherapeutic, psychodynamic, cognitive, somatic, etc. <clears throat> Relational work happens between therapist and, um, and client. Uh, resolution and tracking of numbness and dissociation. Individual dose refinement minimizes dissociation from meds. Sitter can, in power, sitter can customize focus and activities to increase power or to release repressed power and cultivate healthy power if stuck. Tennis racket. If you've got a one-on-one, -on -one, that was part of what really helped me was getting the tennis racket out and beating the living shit out of something. Hard to do that in when you've got, you know, um, eye mask and headphones on or if you're in a room with a bunch of other people, they tend to frown on that. Love, opening to self-love and to blocks of interpersonal love available in the exquisite container with the sitter. So some of what happens in the psychotherapeutic model I've already mentioned in, my, in the beginning piece of my own story. So the next piece is integration. So let me find what I wrote about that on here. There's a, <clears throat> so using a psychedelic integration therapist is a great way to access good support when you can't get to a map study. There's a map study that's happening right now and there's going to be a massive list for it and the open access may happen and people that aren't in the study can still get sitting in a couple of years, theoretically. But if you don't have access to that kind of thing, what do you do and how do you play with with um, therapists. You can work with somebody legally without doing the medicine with them. You can, um, you know, prep with them and do after work with them. But it's, uh, it's tricky. It's tricky. And, you know, the, the playing with that um, is important. You know, you want to be taking care of yourself in doing this. <clears throat> So here's some guidelines. Oh, let me go back to that. 
So yeah, trained in trauma resolution, experience with psychedelics, and with soul retrieval. But most important, somebody you feel safe with. A friend of mine told me the other day that um, the studies that they've done about this stuff is that if there's rapport between the client and the therapist, this is just regular psychotherapy, if there's rapport, the likelihood of success is huge, even if the therapist is not doing that much. Just the rapport can make a lot happen. It's a very important piece, so pay attention to that. So this is the, the gist of it here. This is the broad scope of the journey that we just took. Um, and this is the, the pitch piece of it, which is only a second or two long here. I have um, offer that I've got a phone number on here. If you want to um, apply for a free session, you can text your first and last name, no space or no comma, no nothing. Just text it to that, and um, and then you'll get a keyword requested for a keyword, and then you put session in there. Um, the other is um, I lead a men's group for introverts. It's a small, intimate, uh, we max out at six, and we meet once a week for eight-week cycles, typically also have a one-day workshop, and it's been really fun and really powerful. A couple of guys from the group are here, and it's, um, it's good stuff, so you know you can check it out on that, on that site there. Um, so that's it. I want to thank you for sitting and listening to me for, I guess it's been an hour or something. Um, and I want to thank Caitlin and the AWARE Project and, um, and also Kanan um, for hooking us up with this space, for consciousness hacking. It's another meetup group that anyone involved in this would be fascinated, I believe, to join some of Kanan's group, Kanan's meetings with kind of bringing technology and consciousness together. It's good stuff. So I have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, go ahead. What is like um, soul escape? Like, um, spiritual like, bypass. What were some of the practices that you suggest to people to do? Some of the practices. So, so spiritual bypass is doing anything and like you can be a, you can be like oh I'm having a bad feeling I'm gonna go meditate or I'm gonna go do yoga or I'm gonna go think positively so right so the, all these are good things they're not necessarily bad things but so yeah meditation yoga um, um, positive thinking is one that gets twisted very quickly and goes down that road um, and I don't know anybody else well, I just think of sometimes people flee to ashrams or other places so they don't have to right. know, deal with the viscera of real relationship and right. the grit of work. And I mean, that can be very healing to me as well. I think a lot of people are escaping to a simpler, in a way, less intimate life mm -hmm. sometimes. Right. Right. No, that's, that's accurate. I feel compelled to share my observation that many people who do ayahuasca and you're naming say something say they're directing them toward their right. goal but they're not no I've, I've spoken with a number of therapists uh, especially in the MAPS community which are more research based and fact based and all of that that are experienced with spiritual bypass and there is a concern that the, that the growing popularity of ayahuasca in particular is um, fostering a level of spiritual bypass and spiritual pride that is very difficult for people that are in it to catch because the they're already at they're working at an edge all the time and they're stretching and they're used to being rebels and they're used to being you know not accepted on some level for what they're doing and they've normalized the confrontation around spiritual bypassing to the point where they're denying it. And I don't know what to do with that other than say something every once in a while. But I, I agree with you, there is, there is that for sure. But it's not necessarily 
that. Like, I don't believe that the use of psychedelics is by definition spiritual bypassing. Don't mean that at all. I think it's very possible to be spiritual bypassing with it, but um, if we're paying attention, we're not going to be doing spiritual bypassing. Yeah. Obviously, I know the answer to this question is, compli is it's complicated and different times call for different things, but mm -hmm. what is your view on also taking the substance when you are sitting versus not taking it at all or anything while you're sitting? Well, um, I would speak um, from stories that I've heard about that. Um, I, I know in, um, in the ayahuasca world, the, the shaman often takes some minor dose or moderate dose and that helps them tap into, tap into the field that the people are in. Um, and the man that I did much of my psychedelic psychotherapy with would from time to time smoke pot to help him be able to tap into and help me work through my cognitive bypass. It's like he needed to get stoned to be able to see where the portals were in my defenses. Um, and then others don't do anything. So I don't know as if there's a right or wrong way, way to play with it. I would be suspect of a sitter or shaman taking a full dose and getting really lost in some way with what they're doing. Um, and I have heard of that. And I've heard of ayahuasca shamans that were alcoholics, both below, both in South America and up here. And so it, there's no guarantee of anything in this world. I feel like there's probably a lot of people, a lot of the population would most benefit from this kind of uh, uh, treatment. Um, they're currently on uh, more you know, mainstream prescription drugs like Effexor or Lamictal, which they say, you know, it's like you're not supposed to take uh, DNA or anything while on that. Mm -hmm. Now, would you have any recommendations for those people? And perhaps you have an opinion in general with regard to big pharma prescription drugs? Yeah, well, I, I can I'll, I'll answer that through what I've understood has been the kind of party line and the protocol out of the MAPS phase three study, which is um, there are a number of medications that are, um, that don't work well with MDMA. And the, the patient needs to wean off of them. And I believe the, the number is five half-lifes. So there's a, Anybody know what I'm talking about here? That's the, so that you need, like each medication has a different half-life. And so you need to be done not taking any for five half-lifes, which for some things might be a few days and other things might be weeks. So um, I don't know what the half-life is of your particular medication that you mentioned, but that's something you can find out fairly easily. And, and I believe some of this is published on the MAPS website, but I'm not positive. Heard of any of these psychedelics being used to increase intelligence? <coughs> Definitely. Um. Anybody know where I'm going here? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. <laughs> Steve Jobs used LSD extensively and and said that it's part of what what helped him. So there's um, Kanan. What's the term for using medic medication for? Neurotropics, nootropics, yeah, nootropics. So there are certainly people using microdosing of um, various meds, all of them that I've heard of now, to have different intelligence shifts. What was that? Cap of Silicon Valley. I still couldn't hear you. Cap of Silicon Valley. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. Oh, uh, for the Groff method, I don't know if you said it and I missed it, but uh, are the headphones supposed to be creating silence or like a customized sound? Music typically. Music. There's music. Okay, yeah, I couldn't tell. I didn't see yeah. words coming out of the graphic. Right. <laughs> like, right. Is it supposed to be like entirely self generated? Or yeah. Spongle. Right. Spongle. Or yeah. There's so so one of the one of the reasons that I'm a little challenged by that is that when I've been on medicine myself, music will take me down roads that I may or may not want to go. 
And so there is an input, you know, it's like if you're not picking who it is that you're journeying with, or if you're picking, you're being very choosy about who you're journeying with, but you're not being choosy about the music, I would invite you to take a look at that. Because <laughs> you're probably going to be more affected by the music if you're wearing headphones and, I and guess, eye mask. I guess a follow-up question is, have you heard various, like, I don't know if there would be something so far as stats, but at least anecdotal evidence on the efficacy with music versus, like, without. Because, like, without, to me, intuitively feels like it would be more intense. But like you said, like, the music feels like it has a sort of, like, inbred momentum in the direction of your trip that, you know, might, you know, put you on a different vector than, like, where your, you know, needs are. Right, right. Well, for, so, for instance, um, my sitter kind of sensed that I was, like, sitting on a big boatload of anger, and he put on some music. And nodded to the tennis racket. And I went down that rabbit hole and, you know, it was like Anger Fist or some crazy, you know, really heavy-duty metal. And it helps. Like, it is super helpful. When you've got the right music to fit where you are, it is, music is, in, it's like almost more important than the medicine. But if it's not the right fit, it's, it can be a problem. Or it can be not the right fit because you're really resistant. So it's, you know, it's hard to, you gotta, you gotta have somebody there with you that can sense what, what it is and be like, yeah, I know you hate this, but we're going to keep listening. Yeah. So after all this, what personally have you gotten in terms of your presence or uh, integration of your self? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and um, like I said, I'm just a flyover on a million things, and I, that was one of the ones that I thought of to bring in. But the the way that I talk about it now is the the rat tangle is a tool, a symbol that I use, and many of you in the audience that I've worked with know this, and and have integrated it into your own speak on some level, and. And the question becomes, well, what is my life like when I'm not caught in the paradigm of the rat tangle? What is it without that? And initially without it, there's this emptiness, which, which really triggered me at first. And, and then as I hung out with it more, it, I realized that it was benevolent emptiness. And, and I now have access to that more than I ever have go there when I when I need to or I might need to go sit in a flotation tank for a couple hours to get to it but I know what I'm aiming for and and I I can access it I have a beautiful garden that I sit in or you know friends that I sit with or just being walking down the street or in nature I can feel that and I couldn't I couldn't 20 years ago 10 years ago Lines of soul retrieval, and I guess it kind of speaks to um, uh, the ability of measuring whether or not spiritual bypass, or you're seeing some some uh, results, like you're talking about healing results. So when you um, when you take a psychedelic, whether it be in therapy or in a natural setting, and then you're seeing some uh, quality of life improvement. So in your therapies, are there is there a beginning uh, intention set, and then are there measures and marks that show? Because when you deal with some, some somatic healing, I'm assuming that it, it isn't all cognitive, right? So that there's going to be right. some level of, level of anxiety you're able to measure. So how do, when do you do that, and how do you define like retrieval? So at what point? Because there's a lot of different ways you can define soul retrieval. So. Sure, sure. And and this is a three-hour conversation, <laughs> but so I guess um, more in line to like specifically the the application of the medicine in the therapeutic environment. So you can sit with somebody and talk. Right. The measure, so we know we're not doing spiritual bypass. Right. Well, so I, I didn't. I, I have another chart that some of you have seen that um, plays with power, love, and presence in a in a different way, where there are power, love, and presence are the are the rows, and then the columns are trauma, duality, personal, interpersonal, and omnipersonal. 
And what happens for many of us is that we try and solve things by skipping over the personal column into the interpersonal. We try and go into love relationship and get our partner to fill us, fix us. Or we skip both that, skip both the personal and the interpersonal and go into the omnipersonal, which is spiritual bypass. And so very often what what I like to say is that the starting point and the fallback point after you have get triggered is personal presence. So the start, like when people are really dysregulated, that's the starting point. We don't need to work on 19 million things. We don't need to work on their relationship. We don't need to work on, you know, their relationship to God. It's about just being able to tolerate the sensation of being here now without the music, in between breaths. And that's a marker. People come to me sometimes and they can't come anywhere near that. And they might want to work on 19 different things and we might do that, but I keep, I'll keep coming back and educating them and pointing them out that, you know, maybe you might want to go to the flotation tank rather than go to the bar and, and cultivate that presence. So the, in that respect, there, there are markers and that map of working with power, love and presence is effective whether you're dealing with medicine or not. Does that answer your question? It does, and I guess what I was leading to more was kind of a statement in being working in the same field is that if you're using the medicines and you teach them or you find that they have a greater capacity to pause when agitated and then mm-hmm. to utilize whatever it is that you're giving, whatever plan that they, they have, and that's why I'm like a firm believer of like you're not taking a lot of input when you do medicines. Nature is probably one of the better ones. And then that safety and security, because if, if you're not safe, if you don't feel secure, you can't allow things to come up. You're constantly on edge. Right. So those are some really powerful points that you hit on that like if they're not present, who cares if you're a good therapist? Right. And music is a major Exactly. Situation. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. One more. styles of therapy, and, um, and some of which I'm familiar with, but I'm wondering if the application varies much when the medicine is there, or it's really application of right. uh, some of those styles. Well, it, that's a great question, Jake, and, I, and the answer would be for me in the, you remember I, I spoke of the my, my journeys with my psychedelic psychotherapist where I was learning somatic experiencing work and doing that work on myself while I was on these medicines and teaching my sitter about SE work and playing in that. And, and what I found is that over the last, whatever, 12 years that I've been an SE therapist, that that model of working with the involuntary, with the body responses, with the physiology, with tracking, with the pendulation into the intensity and the activation and the deactivation and resourcing, that can happen and really needs to happen before you take the medicines. Learning that skill on, an, on your own and being able to like, navigate that you know, the, the part of the SE model is that you don't do cathartic process. Well, what is doing a bunch of drugs but a cathartic process? Like, it is very contrary to this fundamental premise in the SE work. And yet, what I've found is that navigating the, the activation cycle and the deactivation cycle and having the person know how to do that before they ever take the drugs can make it so that they don't get into overwhelm, they don't get into catharsis. They can have these very nicely woven activation, discharge, deactivation, 
resource and do that a number of times on a particular journey. So the, the shorter answer to your question is that it's possible to do a ton of trauma healing just with somatic experiencing and, the, and that kind of work and not do any psychedelics. But in particular, I think for soul retrieval and some of the more deeply embedded traumas, you need a big old crowbar. And these are crowbars. Fabian talked last at the Aware Project about his microdosing, uh -huh. about how you know, if you do microdosing but you don't have the experience, well, how does that help you deal with your trauma? And it kind of goes to the somatic experiencing, which is it's not actually going through a cathartic process. Because it's a psychedelic and it's permeated the blood-brain barrier, that fire is not as uh, rigid, and therefore you can put in place some alternative structure. So it's really more of a conscious process with less resistance. Right. So it's a it's really interesting if you get a chance to see what he did or what he's doing, because you can do it without the cathartic experience. Okay. So. Okay, thank you. Are we good? Yes, thank All right. you. So um, after we have our talks, we like to do something that's a little creative and artistic to kind of um, counterbalance the heaviness of some of the topics that we go over sometimes. So we have Melinda. She's going to come up here and do um, a brief poetry reading for us. Melinda? years ago, but every time we do it, it's different. So my name is Melinda. I work at the Old Globe Theater doing arts engagement there. Um, this first piece that I'm going to give you, and I'm not going to keep you here for too long. I know everybody's, it's getting late. It's a weeknight. But uh, this is a piece that everyone always cuts out of Macbeth. Anybody know Macbeth? Okay. In the business, we call it the Scottish play because it's bad luck to say it in the theater. Many bad things happen when that happens. Don't ever say Macbeth in a theater. Um, but there's a beautiful monologue that's always cut out because it's just one monologue. She has one scene. And uh, she's actually the, the lead witch. We know that there's three witches in Macbeth, right? Hecate is the lead witch, and she's always cut out. And in Greek mythology, Hecate is the goddess of witchcraft and magic. And she's often, there are often shrines outside of doors in Thrace uh, for Hecate because she's also a symbol of prosperity and protection. Uh, um, at the beginning of time, she was uh, portrayed as a singular entity, but over time, um, in art, she began to be um, three-faced. So, uh, this piece, she's really pissed off at the witches because they've been talking to Macbeth without her, and she's having none of it. shall come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide your charms and everything beside. I am for the air, and this night I'll spin unto a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon. Upon the corner of the moon there hangs a vaporous drop Profound, and I'll catch it ere it come to ground. And that, ooh, that distilled by magic slights shall rise such artificial sprites. Oh, 
and by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. He shall spurn fate, ah, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is a mortal's chiefest enemy. with a really short piece. This is um, one of Shakespeare's sonnets. He wrote 154 sonnets, or 154 sonnets are attributed to the work of William Shakespeare. Um, many people think that he was many people, uh, depending on what you think. So there's 154 sonnets. This one's 16, uh, number 16. A sonnet is 14 lines of poetry with common uh, rhyme, and in English, uh, most of them have 10 syllables. Wherefore do not you a mightier way make war upon this bloody tyrant time, and fortify yourself in your decay with means more blessed than my barren rhyme? Now stand you on the tops of happy hours with many maiden gardens yet unset with virtuous wish would bear your living flowers, much like her than your painted counterpart. So should the lines of life that life repair, which this time's pencil or my pupil pen, neither an inward worth nor an outward fair, can make you live yourself in the eyes of men. To give away yourself, keeps yourself still. And you must live drawn by your own sweet. All right, guys, a um, couple quick announcements. First of all, thank you for coming. It's so great to have you all. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Melinda, for that lovely Shakespeare. So um, I also want to thank uh, Travis for videotaping this. And our volunteers, Mario, please stand up. And Jake in the back. <laughs> um, and before you guys go, um, we have this area until 10 p.m., so we have a few more minutes. And I really want to encourage you to introduce yourself to someone you don't know because these events really um, are about connecting community and um, creating a strong sense of interconnection so that we can really um, create an environment that we can develop um, applications uh, for these substances appropriately. So thank you very much for coming. And if you're interested in um, our other events, uh, please feel free to sign up for our newsletter. There's a um, piece of paper outside. Um, and if you signed up on Eventbrite, then you already have your email, so you're good to go. And uh, thank you so much again for your time. Thank you.